During the winter of 1927-28, officials of the federal government made a strange and secret investigation of certain conditions in the ancient Massachusetts seaport of Innsmouth. The public first learned of it in February, when a vast series of raids and arrests occurred, followed by the deliberate burning and dynamiting under suitable precautions of an enormous number of crumbling, worm-eaten and supposedly empty houses along the abandoned waterfront. Uninquiring souls let this occurrence pass as one of the major clashes in a spasmodic war on liquor. Keener news followers, however, wondered at the prodigious number of arrests, the abnormally large force of men used in making them, and the secrecy surrounding the disposal of the prisoners. No trials or even definite charges were reported, nor were any of the captives seen thereafter in the regular jails of the nation. There were vague statements about disease and concentration camps, and later about dispersal in various naval and military prisons, but nothing positive ever developed. Innsmouth itself was left almost depopulated and is even now only beginning to show signs of a sluggishly revived existence. Complaints from many liberal organisations were met with long confidential discussions and representatives were taken on trips to certain camps and prisons. As a result, these societies became surprisingly passive and reticent. Newspaper men were harder to manage, but seemed largely to cooperate with the government in the end. Only one paper, a tabloid always discounted because of its wild policy, mentioned the deep-diving submarine that discharged torpedoes downward in the marine abyss just beyond Devil Reef. That item, gathered by chance in a haunt of sailors, seemed indeed rather far-fetched, since the low black reef lies a full mile and a half out from Innsmouth Harbour. People around the country and in the nearby towns muttered a great deal among themselves, but said very little to the outer world. They had talked about dying and half-deserted Innsmouth for nearly a century, and nothing new could be wilder or more hideous than what they had whispered and hinted years before. Many things had taught them secretiveness, and there was now no need to exert pressure on them. Besides, they really knew very little. For wide salt marshes, desolate and unpeopled, keep neighbours off from Innsmouth on the landward side. But at last, I'm going to defy the ban on speech about this thing. Results, I am certain, are so thorough that no public harm, save a shock of repulsion, could ever accrue from a hinting of what was found by those horrified raiders at Innsmouth. Besides, what was found might possibly have more than one explanation. I do not know just how much of the whole tale has been told even to me, and I have many reasons for not wishing to probe deeper. For my contact with this affair has been closer than that of any other layman, and I have carried away impressions which are yet to drive me to drastic measures. It was I who fled frantically out of Innsmouth in the early morning hours of July 16th, 1927, and whose frightened appeals for government inquiry and action brought on the whole reported episode. I was willing enough to stay mute while the affair was fresh and uncertain. But now that it is an old story with public interest and curiosity gone, I have an odd craving to whisper about those few frightful hours in that ill-rumoured and evilly shadowed seaport of death and blasphemous abnormality. The mere telling helps me to restore confidence in my own faculties, to reassure myself that I was not simply the first to succumb to a contagious nightmare hallucination. It helps me too in making up my mind regarding a certain terrible step which lies ahead of me.
I never heard of Innsmouth till the day before I saw it for the first, and so far, last time. I was celebrating my coming of age by a tour of New England, sightseeing, antiquarian, and genealogical, and had planned to go directly from ancient Newburyport to Arkham, whence my mother's family was derived. I had no car, but was travelling by train, trolley, and motor coach, always seeking the cheapest possible route. In Newburyport, they told me that the steam train was the thing to take to Arkham, and it was only at the station ticket office when I demurred at the high fare that I learned about Innsmouth. The stout, shrewd-faced agent, whose speech showed him to be no local man, seemed sympathetic toward my efforts at economy and made a suggestion that none of my other informants had offered. You could take that old bus, I suppose, he said with a certain hesitation, but it ain't thought much of hereabouts. It goes through Innsmouth. You may have heard about that, and so the people don't like it. Run by an Innsmouth fellow, Joe Sargent, but never gets any custom from here or Arkham either, I guess. Wonder it keeps running at all. I suppose it's cheap enough, but I never see more than two or three people in it. Nobody but those Innsmouth folks. Leaves the square, front of Hammond's drugstore, at 10 a.m. and 7 p.m., unless they've changed lately. Looks like a terrible rattle trap. I've never been on it. That was the first I ever heard of shadowed Innsmouth. Any reference to a town not shown on common maps or listed in recent guidebooks would have interested me, and the agent's odd manner of illusion roused something like real curiosity. A town able to inspire such dislike in its neighbours, I thought, must be at least rather unusual and worthy of a tourist's attention. If it came before Arkham, I would stop off there. And so I asked the agent to tell me something about it. He was very deliberate and spoke with an air of feeling slightly superior to what he said. Innsmouth? Well, it's a queer kind of a town down at the mouth of the Monuxet. Used to be almost a city, quite a port before the War of 1812, but all gone to pieces in the last hundred years or so. No railroad now. B and M never went through, and the branch line from Rowley was given up years ago. More empty houses than there are people, I guess, and no business to speak of except fishing and lobstering. Everybody trades mostly here or in Arkham or Ipswich. Once they had quite a few mills, but nothing's left now except one gold refinery running on the leanest kind of part-time. That refinery, though, used to be a big thing, and old man Marsh, who owns it, must be richer and Crucis. Queer old duck, though, and sticks mighty close in his home. He's supposed to have developed some skin disease or deformity late in life that makes him keep out of sight. Grandson of Captain Obed Marsh, who founded the business. His mother seems to have been some kind of foreigner. They say a South Sea Islander. So everybody raised Cain when he married an Ipswich girl 50 years ago. They always do that about Innsmouth people. And folks here and hereabouts always try to cover up any Innsmouth blood they have in them. But Marsh's children and grandchildren look just like anyone else. So far's I can see. I've had them pointed out to me here, though, come to think of it, the elder children don't seem to be around lately, never saw the old man. And why is everybody so down on Innsmouth? Well, young fellow, you mustn't take too much stock in what people around here say. They're hard to get started, but once they do get started, they never let up. They've been telling things about Innsmouth, whispering them, mostly, for the last hundred years, I guess. 
and I gather they're more scared than anything else. Some of the stories would make you laugh about old Captain Marsh driving bargains with the devil and bringing imps out of hell to live in Innsmouth, or about some kind of devil worship and awful sacrifices in some place near the wharves that people stumbled on around 1845 or thereabouts. But I come from Panton, Vermont, and that kind of story don't go down with me. You ought to hear, though, what some of the old-timers tell about the Black Reef off the coast. Devil Reef, they call it. It's well above water a good part of the time and never much below it, but at that you could hardly call it an island. The story is that there's a whole legion of devils seen sometimes on that reef, sprawled about or darting in and out of some kind of caves near the top. It's a rugged, uneven thing, a good bit over a mile out. And toward the end of shipping days, sailors used to make big detours just to avoid it. That is, sailors that didn't hail from Innsmouth. One of the things they had against old Captain Marsh was that he was supposed to land on it sometimes at night when the tide was right. Maybe he did, for I dare say the rock formation was interesting and it's just barely possible he was looking for pirate loot and maybe finding it. But there was talk of his dealing with demons there. Fact is, I guess on the whole, it was really the captain that gave the bad reputation to the reef. That was before the big epidemic of 1846, when over half the folks in Innsmouth was carried off. They never did quite figure out what the trouble was, but it was probably some foreign kind of disease brought from China or somewhere by the shipping. It surely was bad enough. There was riots over it and all sorts of ghastly doings that I don't believe ever got outside of town. And it left the place in awful shape. Never came back. There can't be more than 300 or 400 people living there now. But the real thing behind the way folks feel is simply race prejudice. And I don't say I'm blaming those that hold it. I hate those Innsmouth folks myself, and I wouldn't care to go to their town. I suppose you know, though I can see you're a Westerner by your talk, what a lot our New England ships used to have to do with queer ports in Africa, Asia, the South Seas, and everywhere else and what queer kinds of people they sometimes brought back with them. You've probably heard about the Salem man that came home with a Chinese wife. And maybe you know there's still a bunch of Fiji Islanders somewhere around Cape Cod. Well, there must be something like that back of the Innsmouth people. The place always was badly cut off from the rest of the country by marshes and creeks, and we can't be sure about the ins and outs of the matter, but it's pretty clear that old Captain Marsh must have brought home some odd specimens when he had all three of his ships in commission back in the 20s and 30s. There certainly is a strange kind of streak in the Innsmouth folks today. I don't know how to explain it, but it sort of makes you crawl. You'll notice a little in Sargent if you take his bus. Some of them have queer narrow heads with flat noses and bulgy, starey eyes that never seem to shut. And their skin ain't quite right. Rough and scabby, and the sides of their necks are all shriveled or creased up. Get bald too, very young. The older fellows look the worst. Fact is, I don't believe I've ever seen a very old chap of that kind. Guess they must die of looking in the glass. Animals hate them. They used to have lots of horse trouble before autos came in. Nobody around here or in Arkham or Ipswich will have anything to do with them. And they act kind of offish themselves when they come to town or when anyone tries to fish on their grounds. Queer how fish are always thick off Innsmouth Harbour when there ain't any anywhere else around. But just try to fish there yourself and see how the folks chase you off. Those people used to come here on the railroad, walking and taking the train at Rowley after the branch was dropped. But now they use that bus. Yes, 
There's a hotel in Innsmouth called the Gilman House, but I don't believe it can amount to much. I wouldn't advise you to try it. Better stay over here and take the 10 o'clock bus tomorrow morning. Then you can get an evening bus there for Arkham at 8 o'clock. There was a factory inspector who stopped at the Gilman a couple of years ago, and he had a lot of unpleasant hints about the place. Seems they get a queer crowd there, for this fellow heard voices in other rooms, though most of them was empty, that gave him the shivers. It was foreign talk, he thought, but he said the bad thing about it was the kind of voice that sometimes spoke. It sounded so unnatural, slopping like he said, that he didn't dare undress and go to sleep, just waited up and lit out the first thing in the morning. The talk went on most all night. This fellow, Casey his name was, had a lot to say about how the Innsmouth folks watched him and seemed kind of on guard. He found the marsh refinery a queer place. It's in an old mill on the lower falls of the Manuxet. What he said tallied up with what I'd heard. Books in bad shape and no clear account of any kind of dealings. You know it's always been a kind of mystery where the marshes get the gold they refine. They've never seemed to do much buying in that line. But years ago, they shipped out an enormous lot of ingots. Used to be talk of a queer foreign kind of jewellery that the sailors and refinery men sometimes sold on the sly or that was seen once or twice on some of the marsh women folks. People allowed maybe old Captain Abed traded for it in some heathen port especially since he was always ordering stacks of glass beads and trinkets such as seafaring men used to get for native trade. Others thought and still think he'd found an old pirate cache out on Devil Reef. But here's a funny thing. The old captain's been dead these 60 years and there ain't been a good-sized ship out of the place since the Civil War, but just the same... The marshes still keep on buying a few of those native trade things, mostly glass and rubber gewgaws, they tell me. Maybe the Innsmouth folks like them to look at themselves. Gord knows they've gotten to be about as bad as South Sea cannibals and Guinea savages. That plague of 46 must have taken off the best blood in the place. Anyway, they're a doubtful lot now and the marshes and the other rich folks are as bad as any. As I told you, there probably ain't more than 400 people in the whole town, in spite of all the streets they say there are. I guess they're what they call white trash down south, lawless and sly and full of secret doings. They get a lot of fish and lobsters and do exporting by truck. Queer how the fish swarm right there and nowhere else. Nobody can ever keep track of these people and state school officials and census men have a devil of a time. You can bet that prying strangers ain't welcome around Innsmouth. I've heard personally of more than one business or government man that's disappeared there and there's loose talk of one who went crazy and is out at Danvers now. They must have fixed up some awful scare for that fellow. That's why I wouldn't go at night if I was you. I've never been there and have no wish to go, but I guess a daytime trip couldn't hurt you, even though the people hereabouts will advise you not to make it, if you're just sightseeing and looking for old-time stuff. Innsmouth ought to be quite a place for you. And so I spent part of that evening at the Newburyport Public Library looking up data about Innsmouth when I had tried to question the natives in the shops, the lunchroom, the garages and the fire station. I had found them even harder to get started than the ticket agent had predicted and realised that I could not spare the time to overcome their first instinctive reticences. They had a kind of obscure suspiciousness, as if there was something amiss with anyone too much interested 
in Innsmouth. At the YMCA, where I was stopping, the clerk merely discouraged my going to such a dismal, decadent place, and the people at the library showed much the same attitude. Clearly, in the eyes of the educated, Innsmouth was merely an exaggerated case of civic degeneration. The Essex County histories on the library shelves had very little to say, except that the town was founded in 643, noted for shipbuilding before the Revolution, a seat of great marine prosperity in the early 19th century, and later a minor factory centre using the Manuxet as power. The epidemic and riots of 1846 were very sparsely treated, as if they formed a discredit to the county. References to decline were few, though the significance of the later record was unmistakable. After the Civil War, all industrial life was confined to the Marsh Refining Company, and the marketing of gold ingots formed the only remaining bit of major commerce, aside from the eternal fishing. That fishing paid less and less as the price of the commodity fell and large-scale corporations offered competition. But there was never a dearth of fish around Innsmouth Harbour. Foreigners seldom settled there, and there was some discreetly veiled evidence that a number of Poles and Portuguese who had tried it had been scattered in a peculiarly drastic fashion. Most interesting of all was a glancing reference to the strange jewellery vaguely associated with Innsmouth. It had evidently impressed the whole countryside more than a little, for mention was made of specimens in the Museum of Miskatonic University at Arkham and in the display room of the Newburyport Historical Society. The fragmentary descriptions of these things were bald and prosaic, but they hinted to me an undercurrent of persistent strangeness. Something about them seemed so odd and provocative that I could not put them out of my mind, and despite the relative lateness of the hour, I resolved to see the local sample, said to be a large, queerly proportioned thing, evidently meant for a tiara, if it could possibly be arranged. The librarian gave me a note of introduction to the curator of the society, a Miss Anna Tilton, who lived nearby, and after a brief explanation, that ancient gentlewoman was kind enough to pilot me into the closed building. Since the hour was not outrageously late, the collection was a notable one indeed, but in my present mood, I had eyes for nothing but the bizarre object which glistened in a corner cupboard under the electric lights. It took no excessive sensitiveness to beauty to make me literally gasp at the strange, unearthly splendour of the alien, opulent fantasy that rested there on a purple velvet cushion. Even now I can hardly describe what I saw, though it was clearly enough a sort of tiara, as the description had said. It was tall in front and with a very large and curiously irregular periphery, as if designed for a head of almost freakishly elliptical outline. The material seemed to be predominantly gold, though a weird, lighter lustrousness hinted at some strange alloy with an equally beautiful and scarcely identifiable metal. Its condition was almost perfect, and one could have spent hours in studying the striking and puzzlingly untraditional designs, some simply geometrical and some plainly marine, chased or moulded in high relief on its surface with a craftsmanship of incredible skill and grace. The longer I looked, the more the thing fascinated me, and in this fascination there was a curiously disturbing element hardly to be classified or accounted for. At first I decided that it was the queer, otherworldly quality of the art which made me uneasy. All other art objects I had ever seen either belonged to some known racial or national stream, or else were consciously modernistic defiances of every recognised stream. This tiara was neither. <laughs> 
It clearly belonged to some settled technique of infinite maturity and perfection. Yet that technique was utterly remote from any Eastern or Western, ancient or modern, which I had ever heard of or seen exemplified. It was as if the workmanship were that of another planet. However, I soon saw that my uneasiness had a second and perhaps equally potent source residing in the pictorial and mathematical suggestions of the strange designs. The patterns all hinted of remote secrets and unimaginable abysses in time and space, and the monotonously aquatic nature of the reliefs became almost sinister. Among these reliefs were fabulous monsters of abhorrent grotesqueness and malignity, half ichthyic and half Batrachian in suggestion, which one could not dissociate from a certain haunting and uncomfortable sense of pseudo-memory, as if they called up some image from deep cells and tissues whose retentive functions are wholly primal and awesomely ancestral. At times, I fancied that every contour of these blasphemous fish frogs was overflowing with the ultimate quintessence of unknown and inhuman evil. In odd contrast to the tiara's aspect was its brief and prosy history, as related by Miss Tilton. It had been pawned for a ridiculous sum at a shop in State Street in 1873 by a drunken Innsmouth man shortly afterward killed in a brawl. The society had acquired it directly from the pawnbroker, at once giving it a display worthy of its quality. It was labelled as of probable East Indian or Indo-Chinese provenance, though the attribution was frankly tentative. Miss Tilton, comparing all possible hypotheses regarding its origin and its presence in New England, was inclined to believe that it formed part of some exotic pirate horde, discovered by old Captain Obed Marsh. This view was surely not weakened by the insistent offers of purchase at a high price which the Marshes began to make as soon as they knew of its presence, and which they repeated to this day, despite the society's unvarying determination not to sell. As the good lady showed me out of the building, she made it clear that the pirate theory of the Marsh fortune was a popular one among the intelligent people of the region. Her own attitude toward shadowed Innsmouth, which she had never seen, was one of disgust at a community slipping far down the cultural scale. And she assured me that the rumours of devil worship were partly justified by a peculiar secret cult which had gained force there and engulfed all the orthodox churches. It was called, she said, the Esoteric Order of Dagon, and was undoubtedly a debased, quasi-pagan thing imported from the East a century before, at a time when the Innsmouth fisheries seemed to be going barren. Its persistence among a simple people was quite natural, in view of the sudden and permanent return of abundantly fine fishing, and it soon came to be the greatest influence on the town, replacing Freemasonry altogether and taking up headquarters in the old Masonic Hall on New Church Green. All this to the pious Miss Tilton formed an excellent reason for shunning the ancient town of decay and desolation, but to me, it was merely a fresh incentive. To my architectural and historical anticipations was now added an acute anthropological zeal, and I could scarcely sleep in my small room at the Y as the night wore away. So, shortly before ten the next morning, I stood with one small valise in front of Hammond's drugstore in Old Market Square, waiting for the Innsmouth bus. As the hour for its arrival drew near, I noticed a general drift of the loungers to other places up the street, or to the ideal lunch across the square. Evidently, the ticket agent had not exaggerated the dislike which local people bore toward Innsmouth and its denizens. 
In a few moments, a small motor coach of extreme decrepitude and dirty grey colour rattled down State Street, made a turn and drew up at the curb beside me. I felt immediately that it was the right one, a guess which the half-illegible sign on the windshield, Arkham Innsmouth, Noob Port, soon verified. There were only three passengers, dark unkempt men of sullen visage and somewhat youthful cast, and when the vehicle stopped, they clumsily shambled out and began walking up State Street in a silent, almost furtive fashion. The driver also alighted, and I watched him as he went into the drugstore to make some purchase. This, I reflected, must be the Joe Sargent mentioned by the ticket agent. And even before I noticed any details, there spread over me a wave of spontaneous aversion which could be neither checked nor explained. It suddenly struck me as very natural that the local people should not wish to ride on a bus owned and driven by this man or to visit any oftener than possible the habitat of such a man and his kinsfolk. When the driver came out of the store, I looked at him more carefully and tried to determine the source of my evil impression. He was a thin, stoop-shouldered man, not much under six feet tall, dressed in shabby blue civilian clothes and wearing a frayed grey golf cap. His age was perhaps 35, but the odd deep creases in the sides of his neck made him seem older when one did not study his dull, expressionless face. He had a narrow head bulging, watery blue eyes that seemed never to wink, a flat nose, a receding forehead and chin, and singularly undeveloped ears. His long, thick lip and coarse-poured greyish cheeks seemed almost beardless, except for some sparse yellow hairs that straggled and curled in irregular patches, and in places the surface seemed queerly irregular, as if peeling from some cutaneous disease. His hands were large and heavily veined, and had a very unusual greyish-blue tinge. The fingers were strikingly short in proportion to the rest of the structure, and seemed to have a tendency to curl closely into the huge palm. As he walked toward the bus, I observed his peculiarly shambling gait and saw that his feet were inordinately immense. The more I studied them, the more I wondered how he could buy any shoes to fit them. A certain greasiness about the fellow increased my dislike. He was evidently given to working or lounging around the fish docks and carried with him much of their characteristic smell. Just what foreign blood was in him, I could not even guess. His oddities certainly did not look Asiatic, Polynesian, Levantine, or Negroid. Yet I could see why the people found him alien. I myself would have thought of biological degeneration rather than alienage. I was sorry when I saw that there would be no other passengers on the bus. Somehow... I did not like the idea of riding alone with this driver. But as leaving time obviously approached, I conquered my qualms and followed the man aboard, extending him a dollar bill and murmuring the single word, Innsmouth. He looked curiously at me for a second as he returned 40 cents change without speaking. I took a seat far behind him, but on the same side of the bus since I wished to watch the shore during the journey. At length, the decrepit vehicle started with a jerk and rattled noisily past the old brick buildings of State Street amidst a cloud of vapour from the exhaust. Glancing at the people on the sidewalks, I thought I detected in them a curious wish to avoid looking at the bus or at least a wish to avoid seeming to look at it. Then we turned to the left into High Street, where the going was smoother, flying by stately old mansions of the early Republic and still older colonial farmhouses, passing the Lower Green and Parker River, and finally emerging into a long, monotonous stretch of open shore country. The day was warm and sunny, 
but the landscape of sand, sedge grass and stunted shrubbery became more and more desolate as we proceeded. Out the window I could see the blue water and the sandy line of Plum Island, and we presently drew very near the beach as our narrow road veered off from the main highway to Rowley and Ipswich. There were no visible houses, and I could tell by the state of the road that traffic was very light hereabouts. The small, weather-worn telephone poles carried only two wires. Now and then we crossed crude wooden bridges over tidal creeks that wound far inland and promoted the general isolation of the region. Once in a while I noticed dead stumps and crumbling foundation walls above the drifting sand and recalled the old tradition quoted in one of the histories I had read that this was once a fertile and thickly settled countryside. The change, it was said, came simultaneously with the Innsmouth epidemic of 1846 and was thought by simple folk to have a dark connection with hidden forces of evil. Actually, it was caused by the unwise cutting of woodlands near the shore, which robbed the soil of its best protection and opened the way for waves of wind-blown sand. At last, we lost sight of Plum Island and saw the vast expanse of the open Atlantic on our left. Our narrow course began to climb steeply and I felt a singular sense of disquiet in looking at the lonely crest ahead where the rutted roadway met the sky. It was as if the bus were about to keep on in its ascent, leaving the sane earth altogether and merging with the unknown arcana of upper air and cryptical sky. The smell of the sea took on ominous implications and the silent driver's bent, rigid back and narrow head became more and more hateful. As I looked at him, I saw that the back of his head was almost as hairless as his face, having only a few straggling yellow strands upon a grey, scabrous surface. Then we reached the crest and beheld the outspread valley beyond, where the Manuxet joins the sea just north of the long line of cliffs that culminate in Kingsport Head and veer off toward Cape Ann. On the far misty horizon I could just make out the dizzy profile of the head, topped by the queer ancient house of which so many legends are told. But for the moment all my attention was captured by the nearer panorama just below me. I had, I realised, come face to face with rumour-shadowed Innsmouth. It was a town of wide extent and dense construction yet one with a portentous dearth of visible life. From the tangle of chimney pots scarcely a wisp of smoke came, and the three tall steeples loomed stark and unpainted against the seaward horizon. One of them was crumbling down at the top, and in that and another there were only black gaping holes where clock dials should have been. The vast huddle of sagging gambrel roofs and peak gables conveyed with offensive clearness the idea of wormy decay, and as we approached along the now descending road, I could see that many roofs had wholly caved in. There were some large square Georgian houses too, with hipped roofs, cupolas and railed widow's walks. These were mostly well back from the water, and one or two seemed to be in moderately sound condition. Stretching inland from among them, I saw the rusted, grass-grown line of the abandoned railway, with leaning telegraph poles, now devoid of wires, and the half-obscured lines of the old carriage roads to Rowley and Ipswich. The decay was worse close to the waterfront, though in its very midst I could spy the white belfry of a fairly well-preserved brick structure which looked like a small factory. The harbour, long clogged with sand, was enclosed by an ancient stone breakwater on which I could begin to discern the minute forms of a few seated fishermen and at whose end were what looked like the foundations of a bygone lighthouse. A sandy tongue 
had formed inside this barrier, and upon it I saw a few decrepit cabins, more dories, and scattered lobster pots. The only deep water seemed to be where the river poured out past the belfried structure and turned southward to join the ocean at the breakwater's end. Here and there the ruins of wharves jutted out from the shore to end in indeterminate rottenness, those farthest south seeming the most decayed. And far out at sea, despite a high tide, I glimpsed a long black line, scarcely rising above the water, yet carrying a suggestion of odd, latent malignancy. This, I knew, must be Devil Reef. As I looked, a subtle, curious sense of beckoning seemed superadded to the grim repulsion, and oddly enough, I found this overtone more disturbing than the primary impression. We met no one on the road, but presently began to pass deserted farms in varying stages of ruin. Then I noticed a few inhabited houses with rags stuffed in the broken windows and shells and dead fish lying about the littered yards. Once or twice, I saw listless-looking people working in barren gardens or digging clams on the fishy-smelling beach below and groups of dirty, simian-visaged children playing around weed-grown doorsteps. Somehow these people seemed more disquieting than the dismal buildings, for almost everyone had certain peculiarities of face and motions which I instinctively disliked without being able to define or comprehend them. For a second I thought this typical physique suggested some picture I had seen, perhaps in a book, under circumstances of particular horror or melancholy. But this pseudo-recollection passed very quickly. As the bus reached a lower level, I began to catch the steady note of a waterfall through the unnatural stillness. The leaning, unpainted houses grew thicker, lined both sides of the road, and displayed more urban tendencies than did those we were leaving behind. The panorama ahead had contracted to a street scene, and in spots I could see where a cobblestone pavement and stretches of brick sidewalk had formerly existed. All the houses were apparently deserted, and there were occasional gaps where tumble-down chimneys and cellar walls told of buildings that had collapsed. Pervading everything was the most nauseous, fishy odour imaginable. Soon, cross streets and junctions began to appear, those on the left leading to shoreward realms of unpaved squalor and decay, while those on the right showed vistas of departed grandeur. So far, I had seen no people in the town, but the now came signs of a sparse habitation. Curtained windows here and there, and an occasional battered motor car at the curb. Pavement and sidewalks were increasingly well-defined, and though most of the houses were quite old, wood and brick structures of the early 19th century, they were obviously kept fit for habitation. As an amateur antiquarian, I almost lost my olfactory disgust and my feeling of menace and repulsion amidst this rich, unaltered survival from the past. But I was not to reach my destination without one very strong impression of poignantly disagreeable quality. The bus had come to a sort of open concourse or radial point with churches on two sides and the bedraggled remains of a circular green in the centre. And I was looking at a large pillared hall on the right-hand junction ahead. The structure's once white paint was now grey and peeling, and the black and gold sign on the pediment was so faded that I could only, with difficulty, make out the words Esoteric Order of Dagon. This, then, was the former Masonic Hall, now given over to a degraded cult. As I strained to decipher this inscription, my notice was distracted by the raucous tones of a cracked bell across the street, and I quickly turned to look out the window on my side of the coach, 
The sound came from a squat-towered stone church of manifestly later date than most of the houses, built in a clumsy Gothic fashion and having a disproportionately high basement with shuttered windows. Though the hands of its clock were missing on the side, I glimpsed, I knew that those hoarse strokes were telling the hour of eleven. Then suddenly all thoughts of time were blotted out by an onrushing image of sharp intensity, an unaccountable horror which had seized me before I knew what it really was. The door of the church basement was open, revealing a rectangle of blackness inside. And as I looked, a certain object crossed or seemed to cross that dark rectangle burning into my brain a momentary conception of nightmare, which was all the more maddening because analysis could not show a single nightmarish quality in it. It was a living object, the first, except the driver, that I had seen since entering the compact part of the town. And had I been in a steadier mood, I would have found nothing whatever of terror in it. Clearly, as I realised a moment later, it was the pastor, clad in some peculiar vestments, doubtless introduced since the Order of Dagon had modified the ritual of the local churches. The thing which had probably caught my first subconscious glance and supplied the touch of bizarre horror was the tall tiara he wore an almost exact duplicate of the one Miss Tilton had shown me the previous evening. This, acting on my imagination, had supplied namelessly sinister qualities to the indeterminate face and robed, shambling form beneath it. There was not, I soon decided, any reason why I should have felt that shuddering touch of evil pseudo-memory. Was it not natural that a local mystery cult should adopt among its regimentals a unique type of headdress made familiar to the community in some strange way, perhaps as treasure trove? A very thin sprinkling of repellent-looking youngish people now became visible on the sidewalks, lone individuals and silent knots of two or three. The lower floors of the crumbling houses sometimes harboured small shops with dingy signs, and I noticed a parked truck or two as we rattled along. The sound of waterfalls became more and more distinct, and presently I saw a fairly deep river gorge ahead, spanned by a wide iron-railed highway bridge beyond which a large square opened out. As we clanked over the bridge, I looked out on both sides and observed some factory buildings on the edge of the grassy bluff or partway down. The water far below was very abundant, and I could see two vigorous sets of falls upstream on my right, and at least one downstream on my left. From this point, the noise was quite deafening. Then we rolled into the large semicircular square across the river and drew up on the right-hand side in front of a tall, cupola-crowned building with remnants of yellow paint and with a half-effaced sign proclaiming it to be the Gilman House. I was glad to get out of that bus and at once proceeded to check my valise in the shabby hotel lobby. There was only one person in sight, an elderly man without what I had come to call the Innsmouth look, and I decided not to ask him any of the questions which bothered me, remembering that odd things had been noticed in this hotel. Instead, I strolled out on the square from which the bus had already gone and studied the scene minutely and appraisingly. One side of the cobblestoned open space was the straight line of the river. The other was a semicircle of slant-roofed brick buildings of about the 1800 period, from which several streets radiated away to the southeast, south and southwest. Lamps were depressingly few and small, all low-powered incandescents, and I was glad that my plans called for departure before dark, even though I knew the moon would be bright. The buildings were all in fair condition and included perhaps a dozen shops in current operation. 
of which one was a grocery of the first national chain, others a dismal restaurant, a drug store, and a wholesale fish dealer's office, and still another at the eastern extremity of the square near the river, an office of the town's only industry, the Marsh Refining Company. There were perhaps ten people visible, and four or five automobiles and motor trucks stood scattered about. I did not need to be told that this was the civic centre of Innsmouth. Eastward I could catch blue glimpses of the harbour, against which rose the decaying remains of three once beautiful Georgian steeples. And toward the shore on the opposite bank of the river I saw the white belfry surmounting what I took to be the marsh refinery. For some reason or other, I chose to make my first inquiries at the chain grocery, whose personnel was not likely to be native to Innsmouth. I found a solitary boy of about 17 in charge, and was pleased to note the brightness and affability which promised cheerful information. He seemed exceptionally eager to talk, and I soon gathered that he did not like the place, its fishy smell or its furtive people. A word with any outsider was a relief to him. He hailed from Arkham, boarded with a family who came from Ipswich, and went back home whenever he got a moment off. His family did not like him to work in Innsmouth, but the chain had transferred him there, and he did not wish to give up his job. There was, he said, no public library or chamber of commerce in Innsmouth, but I could probably find my way about. The street I had come down was Federal. West of that were the fine old residence streets, Broad, Washington, Lafayette, and Adams. And east of it were the Shorewood slums. It was in these slums, along Main Street, that I would find the old Georgian churches. But they were all long abandoned. It would be well not to make oneself too conspicuous in such neighbourhoods, especially north of the river, since the people were sullen and hostile. Some strangers had even disappeared. Certain spots were almost forbidden territory, as he had learned, at considerable cost. One must not, for example, linger much around the marsh refinery or around any of the still-used churches or around the pillared order of Dagon Hall at New Church Green. Those churches were very odd, all violently disavowed by their respective denominations elsewhere, and apparently using the queerest kind of ceremonials and clerical vestments. Their creeds were heterodox and mysterious, involving hints of certain marvellous transformations leading to bodily immortality of a sort on this earth. The youth's own pastor, Dr. Wallace of Asbury M.E. Church in Arkham had gravely urged him not to join any church in Innsmouth. As for the Innsmouth people, the youth hardly knew what to make of them. They were as furtive and seldom seen as animals that live in burrows, and one could hardly imagine how they passed the time apart from their desultory fishing. Perhaps, judging from the quantities of bootleg liquor they consumed, they lay for most of the daylight hours in an alcoholic stupor. They seemed sullenly banded together in some sort of fellowship and understanding, despising the world as if they had access to other and preferable spheres of entity. Their appearance, especially those staring, unwinking eyes which one never saw shut, was certainly shocking enough, and their voices were disgusting. It was awful to hear them chanting in their churches at night, and especially during their main festivals or revivals, which fell twice a year on April 30th and October 31st. They were very fond of the water and swam a great deal in both river and harbour. Swimming races out to Devil Reef were very common and everyone in sight seemed well able to share in this arduous sport. When one came to think of it, it was generally only rather young people who were seen about in public, and of these, the oldest were apt to be the most tainted looking. When exceptions did occur, they were mostly persons with no trace of aberrancy. <laughs>
like the old clerk at the hotel. One wondered what became of the bulk of the older folk, and whether the inn's mouth look were not a strange and insidious disease phenomenon which increased its hold as years advanced. Only a very rare affliction, of course, could bring about such vast and radical anatomical changes in a single individual after maturity, changes involving osseous factors as basic as the shape of the skull. But then even this aspect was no more baffling and unheard of than the visible features of the malady as a whole. It would be hard, the youth implied, to form any real conclusions regarding such a matter, since one never came to know the natives personally, no matter how long one might live in Innsmouth. The youth was certain that many specimens, even worse than the worst visible ones, were kept locked indoors in some places. People sometimes heard the queerest kind of sounds. The tottering waterfront hovels north of the river were reputedly connected by hidden tunnels, being thus a veritable warren of unseen abnormalities. What kind of foreign blood, if any, these beings had, it was impossible to tell. They sometimes kept certain especially repulsive characters out of sight when government agents and others from the outside world came to town. It would be of no use, my informant said, to ask the natives anything about the place. The only one who would talk was a very aged but normal-looking man who lived at the poorhouse on the north rim of the town and spent his time walking about or lounging around the fire station. This hoary character, Zadok Allen, was 96 years old and somewhat touched in the head besides being the town drunkard. He was a strange, furtive creature who constantly looked over his shoulder as if afraid of something, and when sober could not be persuaded to talk at all with strangers. He was, however, unable to resist any offer of his favourite poison, and once drunk would furnish the most astonishing fragments of whispered reminiscence. After all, though, little useful data could be gained from him. Since his stories were all insane, Incomplete hints of impossible marvels and horrors which could have no source save in his own disordered fancy. Nobody ever believed him, but the natives did not like him to drink and talk with strangers. And it was not always safe to be seen questioning him. It was probably from him that some of the wildest popular whispers and delusions were derived. Several non-native residents had reported monstrous glimpses from time to time, but between old Zadok's tales and the malformed denizens, it was no wonder such illusions were current. None of the non-natives ever stayed out late at night, there being a widespread impression that it was not wise to do so. Besides, the streets were loathsomely dark. As for business, the abundance of fish was certainly almost uncanny, but the natives were taking less and less advantage of it. Moreover, prices were falling and competition was growing. Of course, the town's real business was the refinery, whose commercial office was on the square only a few doors east of where we stood. Old Man Marsh was never seen, but sometimes went to the works in a closed curtained car. There were all sorts of rumours about how Marsh had come to look. He had once been a great dandy, and people said he still wore the frock-coated finery of the Edwardian age, curiously adapted to certain deformities. His sons had formerly conducted the office in the square, but latterly they had been keeping out of sight a good deal and leaving the brunt of affairs to the younger generation. The sons and their sisters had come to look very queer, especially the elder ones, and it was said that their health was failing. One of the Marsh daughters was a repellent, reptilian-looking woman who wore an excess of weird jewellery, clearly of the same exotic tradition 
as that to which the strange tiara belonged. My informant had noticed it many times and had heard it spoken of as coming from some secret horde, either of pirates or of demons. The clergymen, or priests, or whatever they were called nowadays, also wore this kind of ornament as a headdress. But one seldom caught glimpses of them. Other specimens the youth had not seen, though many were rumoured to exist around Innsmouth. The marshes, together with the other three gently bred families of the town, the Waits, the Gilmans and the Elliots, were all very retiring. They lived in immense houses along Washington Street and several were reputed to harbour in concealment certain living kinsfolk whose personal aspect forbade public view and whose deaths had been reported and recorded. Warning me that many of the street signs were down, the youth drew for my benefit a rough but ample and painstaking sketch map of the town's salient features. After a moment's study, I felt sure that it would be of great help and pocketed it with profuse thanks. Disliking the dinginess of the single restaurant I had seen, I bought a fair supply of cheese crackers and ginger wafers to serve as a lunch later on. My programme, I decided, would be to thread the principal streets, talk with any non-natives I might encounter, and catch the eight o'clock coach for Arkham. The town I could see formed a significant and exaggerated example of communal decay. But being no sociologist, I would limit my serious observations to the field of architecture. Thus, I began my systematic, though half-bewildered tour of Innsmouth's narrow, shadow-blighted ways. Crossing the bridge and turning toward the roar of the lower falls, I passed close to the marsh refinery, which seemed oddly free from the noise of industry. This building stood on the steep river bluff, near a bridge and an open confluence of streets, which I took to be the earliest civic centre, displaced after the revolution by the present town square. Recrossing the gorge on the Main Street Bridge, I struck a region of utter desertion, which somehow made me shudder. Collapsing huddles of gambrel roofs formed a jagged and fantastic skyline, mm. above which rose the ghoulish decapitated steeple of an ancient church. Some houses along Main Street were tenanted, but most were tightly boarded up. Down unpaved side streets, I saw the black gaping windows of deserted hovels, many of which leaned at perilous and incredible angles through the sinking of part of the foundations. Those windows stared so spectrally that it took courage to turn eastward toward the waterfront. Certainly, the terror of a deserted house swells in geometrical rather than arithmetical progression as houses multiply to form a city of stark desolation. The sight of such endless avenues of fishy-eyed vacancy and death and the thought of such linked infinities of black, brooding compartments given over to cobwebs and memories and the conqueror worm start up vestigial fears and aversions that not even the stoutest philosophy can disperse. Fish Street was as deserted as Maine, though it differed in having many brick and stone warehouses still in excellent shape. Water Street was almost its duplicate, save that there were great seaward gaps where wharves had been. Not a living thing did I see except for the scattered fishermen on the distant breakwater, and not a sound did I hear save the lapping of the harbour tides and the roar of the falls in the Manuxet. The town was getting more and more on my nerves, and I looked behind me furtively as I picked my way back over the tottering Water Street Bridge. The Fish Street Bridge, according to the sketch, was in ruins, 
North of the river, there were traces of squalid life, active fish-packing houses in Water Street, smoking chimneys and patched roofs here and there, occasional sounds from indeterminate sources, and infrequent shambling forms in the dismal streets and unpaved lanes. But I seem to find this even more oppressive than the southerly desertion. For one thing, the people were more hideous and abnormal than those near the centre of the town, so that I was several times evilly reminded of something utterly fantastic which I could not quite place. Undoubtedly, the alien strain in the Innsmouth folk was stronger here than farther inland, unless, indeed, the Innsmouth look were a disease rather than a blood strain, in which case this district might be held to harbour the more advanced cases. One detail that annoyed me was the distribution of the few faint sounds I heard. They ought naturally to have come wholly from the visibly inhabited houses, yet in reality were often strongest inside the most rigidly boarded up facades. There were creakings, scurryings and hoarse, doubtful noises and I thought uncomfortably about the hidden tunnels suggested by the grocery boy. Suddenly I found myself wondering what the voices of those denizens would be like. I had heard no speech so far in this quarter and was unaccountably anxious not to do so. Pausing only long enough to look at two fine but ruinous old churches at Main and Church Streets, I hastened out of that vile waterfront slum. My next logical goal was New Church Green, but somehow or other I could not bear to repass the church, in whose basement I had glimpsed the inexplicably frightening form of that strangely diademed priest or pastor. Besides, the grocery youth had told me that the churches, as well as the order of Dagon Hall, were not advisable neighbourhoods for strangers. Accordingly, I kept north, along Maine to Martin, then turning inland, crossing Federal Street safely north of the Green, and entering the decayed patrician neighbourhood of Northern Broad, Washington, Lafayette and Adams Streets. Though these stately old avenues were ill-surfaced and unkempt, their elm-shaded dignity had not entirely departed. Mansion after mansion claimed my gaze, most of them decrepit and boarded up amidst neglected grounds, but one or two in each street showing signs of occupancy. In Washington Street, there was a row of four or five in excellent repair and with finely tended lawns and gardens. The most sumptuous of these, with wide terrace parterres extending back the whole way to Lafayette Street, I took to be the home of Old Man Marsh, the afflicted refinery owner. In all these streets no living thing was visible, and I wondered at the complete absence of cats and dogs from Innsmouth. Another thing which puzzled and disturbed me, even in some of the best-preserved mansions, was the tightly shuttered condition of many third-storey and attic windows. Furtiveness and secretiveness seemed universal in this hushed city of alienage and death, and I could not escape the sensation of being watched from ambush on every hand by sly, staring eyes that never shut I shivered as the cracked stroke of three sounded from a belfry on my left. Too well did I recall the squat church from which those notes came. Following Washington Street toward the river, I now faced a new zone of former industry and commerce. Noting the ruins of a factory ahead and seeing others with the traces of an old railway station and covered railway bridge beyond, up the gorge on my right. The uncertain bridge now before me was posted with a warning sign, but I took the risk and crossed again to the south bank where traces of life reappeared. Furtive, shambling creatures stared cryptically in my direction, and more normal faces eyed me coldly and curiously.
inn's mouth was rapidly becoming intolerable, and I turned down Payne Street toward the square in the hope of getting some vehicle to take me to Arkham before the still distant starting time of that sinister bus. It was then that I saw the tumble-down fire station on my left and noticed the red-faced, bushy-bearded, watery-eyed old man in nondescript rags who sat on a bench in front of it talking with a pair of unkempt but not abnormal-looking firemen. This, of course, must be Zadok Allen, the half-crazed, licorice nonagenarian whose tales of old inn's mouth and its shadow were so hideous and incredible. Third, it must have been some imp of the perverse or some sardonic pull from dark hidden sources which made me change my plans as I did. I had long before resolved to limit my observations to architecture alone. And I was even then hurrying toward the square in an effort to get quick transportation out of this festering city of death and decay. But the sight of old Zadok Allen set up new currents in my mind and made me slacken my pace uncertainly. I had been assured that the old man could do nothing but hint at wild, disjointed and incredible legends. And I had been warned that the natives made it unsafe to be seen talking to him. Yet the thought of this aged witness to the town's decay with memories going back to the early days of ships and factories, was a lure that no amount of reason could make me resist. After all, the strangest and maddest of myths are often merely symbols or allegories based upon truth. An old Zadok must have seen everything which went on around Innsmouth for the last 90 years. Curiosity flared up beyond sense and caution, and in my youthful egotism, I fancied I might be able to sift a nucleus of real history from the confused, extravagant outpouring I would probably extract with the aid of raw whiskey. I knew that I couldn't accost him then and there, for the fireman would surely notice and object. Instead, I reflected, I would prepare by getting some bootleg liquor at a place where the grocery boy had told me it was plentiful. Then I would loaf near the fire station in apparent casualness and fall in with old Zadok after he had started on one of his frequent rambles. The youth said that he was very restless, seldom sitting around the station for more than an hour or two at a time. A quart bottle of whisky was easily, though not cheaply, obtained in the rear of a dingy variety store just off the square in Elliot Street. The dirty-looking fellow who waited on me had a touch of the staring Innsmouth look, but was quite civil in his way, being perhaps used to the custom of such convivial strangers, truckmen, gold buyers and the like, as were occasionally in town. Re-entering the square, I saw that luck was with me for shuffling out of Payne Street around the corner of the Gilman House. I glimpsed nothing less than the tall, lean, tattered form of old Zadok Allen himself. In accordance with my plan, I attracted his attention by brandishing my newly purchased bottle and soon realised that he had begun to shuffle wistfully after me as I turned into Waite Street on my way to the most deserted region I could think of. I was steering my course by the map the grocery boy had prepared and was aiming for the wholly abandoned stretch of southern waterfront which I had previously visited. The only people in sight there had been the fishermen on the distant breakwater. And by going a few squares south, I could get beyond the range of these, finding a pair of seats on some abandoned wharf and being free to question old Zadok, unobserved for an indefinite time. Before I reached Main Street, I could hear a faint and wheezy, hey, mister, behind me, and I presently allowed the old man to catch up and take copious pulls from the quart bottle. 
I began putting out feelers as we walked along to Water Street and turned southward amidst the omnipresent desolation and crazily tilted ruins, but found that the aged tongue did not loosen as quickly as I had expected. At length I saw a grass-grown opening toward the sea between crumbling brick walls, with the weedy length of an earth and masonry wharf projecting beyond. Piles of moss-covered stones near the water promised tolerable seats, and the scene was sheltered from all possible view by a ruined warehouse on the north. Here, I thought, was the ideal place for a long, secret colloquy. So I guided my companion down the lane and picked out spots to sit in among the mossy stones. The air of death and desertion was ghoulish and the smell of fish almost insufferable, but I was resolved to let nothing deter me. About four hours remained for conversation if I were to catch the eight o'clock coach for Arkham and I began to dole out more liquor to the ancient tippler, meanwhile eating my own frugal lunch. In my donations, I was careful not to overshoot the mark, for I did not wish Zadok's vinous garrulousness to pass into a stupor. After an hour, his furtive taciturnity showed signs of disappearing, but much to my disappointment, he still sidetracked my questions about Innsmouth and its shadow-haunted past. He would babble of current topics, revealing a wide acquaintance with newspapers and a great tendency to philosophise in a sententious village fashion. Toward the end of the second hour, I feared my quart of whisky would not be enough to produce results, and was wondering whether I had better leave old Zadok and go back for more. Just then, however, chance made the opening which my questions had been unable to make, and the wheezing ancient's rambling took a turn that caused me to lean forward and listen alertly. My back was toward the fishy-smelling sea, but he was facing it, and something or other had caused his wandering gaze to light on the low, distant line of Devil Reef, then showing plainly and almost fascinatingly above the waves. The sight seemed to displease him, for he began a series of weak, curses, which ended in a confidential whisper and a knowing leer. He bent toward me, took hold of my coat lapel, and hissed out some hints that could not be mistaken. Thus war it all begun, that cursed place of all wickedness where the deep water starts. Gate of hell, sheer drop down to a bottom, no sound in line can tech. Old Cap Nobed done it, him that found out morn was good for him in the South Sea Islands. Everybody was in a bad way them days. Trade fallen off, mills losing business, even the new ones, and the best of our men folks killed a privateering in the War of 1812 or lost with the Elysee Brig and the Ranger Snow. Both of them Gilman Venters. Obed Marsh, he had three ships afloat, Brigantine Columbi, Brig Hetty, and Bark Sumatry Queen. He was the only one as kept on with the East Indy and Pacific trade, though Esdras Martin's Barkentine Malay pride made a venter as late as 28. Never was nobody like Captain Obed, old limmer Satan. Heh, heh, I can mind him a telling about fur and parts and calling all the folks stupid for going to Christian meeting and bearing their burdens, meek and lowly. Says they'd ought to get better gods like some of the folks in the Inges. Gods as would bring them good fishing in return for their sacrifices and would really answer folks' prayers. Matt Elliot, his fust mate, talked a lot too. Only he was again folks' doing any heathen things. Told Abba out an island east of Otahaite, where they was a lot of stone ruins, older than anybody knew anything about, kind of like them on Ponapi in the Carolines, but with carvings of faces that looked like the big statues on Easter Island. There was a little volcanic island near Thar, too, or there was other ruins with different carvings. Ruins 
all wore away like they'd been under the sea wonked and with pictures of awful monsters all over them. Well, sir, Matt, he says, the natives around that had all the fish they could catch and sported bracelets and armlets and head rigs made out of a queer kind of gold and covered with pictures of monsters just like the ones carved over the ruins on the little island. Sorta fish-like frogs or frog-like fishes that was drawed in all kinds of positions like they was human beings. Nobody could get out of them while they got all the stuff. And all the other natives wondered how they managed to find fish in plenty, even when the very next islands had lean pickings. Matty got to wondering too, and so did Captain Obed. Obed, he notices besides that lots of the hands, some young folks had dropped out of sight for good from year to year, and that they weren't many old folks around. Also, he thinks some of the folks looks derned queer, even for Kanakis. It took Obed to get the truth out of them heathen. I don't know how he done it, but he begun by trading for the gold-like things they wore. Asked them where they come from, and if they could get more, and finally wormed the story out of the old chief. Wallachia, they called him. Nobody but Obed had ever a believed the old yellow devil. But the Captain Cud read folks like they was books. Heh, heh, nobody never believes me now when I tell them. And I don't suppose you will, young fella. Though, come to look at ye, ye have kind a got them sharp ridden eyes like Obed had. The old man's whisper grew fainter and I found myself shuddering at the terrible and sincere portentousness of his intonation, even though I knew his tale could be nothing but drunken fantasy. While, sir, Obed, he learnt that these things on this earth, as most folks never heard about, and wouldn't believe if they did hear. It seems these canakies were sacrificing heaps of their young men and maidens to some kind of God things that lived under the sea and getting all kinds of favour in return. They met the things on the little islet with the queer ruins and it seems the awful pictures of frogfish monsters was supposed to be pictures of these things. Maybe they was the kind of critters as got all the mermaid stories and sech started. They had all kinds of cities on the sea bottom and this island was heaved up from Thar. Seems they were some of the things alive in the stone buildings when the island come up sudden to the surface. That's how the Kanakis got wind. They was down thar. Made sign talk as soon as they got over being skeert and pieced up a bargain afore long. Them things liked human sacrifices, had had them ages afore, but lost track of the upper world after a time. What they done to the victims, it ain't for me to say, and I guess Obed wa'n't none too sharp about asking. But it was all right with the heathens, because they'd been having a hard time and was desperate about everything. They give a certain number of young folks to the sea things twicked every year, May Eve and Halloween, regular as could be. Also, give some of the carved knick-knacks they made. What the things agreed to give in return was plenty of fish. They drove them in from all over the sea, and a few gold-like things now and then. Well, as I says, the natives met the things on the little volcanic islet, going there in canoes with the sacrifices, etc., and bringing back any of the gold-like jewels as was coming to them. At first, the things didn't ever go on to the main island, but arter a time they come to want to. Seems they hankered arter mixing with the folks and having gint ceremonies on the big days, May Eve and Halloween. You see, they was able to live both in and out of water. What they call amphibians, I guess. <laughs> 
The Kanakis told them as how folks from the other islands might want to wipe them out if they got wind of their being there. But they says they don't care much because they could wipe out the whole brood of humans if they was willing to bother. That is, any as didn't if certain signs such as was used once by the lost old ones, whoever they was. But not wanting to bother, they'd lay low when anybody visited the island. When it come to Matten with them toad-looking fishes, the Kanakis kind of balked. But finally, they learnt something as put a new face on the matter. Seems that human folks has got a kind of relation to such water beasts. That everything alive come out of the water once and only needs a little change to go back again. Them things told the Kanakis that if they mix bloods, they'd be children, as I'd look human at first, but later turn more and more like the things, till finally they'd take to the water and join the main lot of things down there. And this is the important part, young fella. Them as turned into fish things and went into the water wouldn't never die. Them things never died except they was kilt violent. While, sir, it seems by the time Obed knowed them islanders, they was all full of fish blood from them deep water things. When they got old and begun to show it, they was kept hid until they felt like taking to the water and quitting the place. Some was more teched than others, and some never did change quite enough to take to the water. But mostly they turned out just the way them things said. Them as was born more like the things changed to Harley. But them as was nearly human sometimes stayed on the island till they was past seventy, though they'd usually go down under for trial trips afore that. Folks as had took to the water generally come back a good deal to visit. So's a man ad often be a talking to his own five times great grandfather, who'd left the dry land a couple of hundred years or so afore. Everybody got out of the idea dying, except in canoe wars with the other islanders, or as sacrifices to the sea gods down below, or from snake bite or plague or sharp galloping ailments or something, afore they could take to the water, but simply looked forward to a kind of change that want a bit horrible arter a while. They thought what they got was well with all they'd had to give up, and I guess Obed kind of come to think the same himself when he chewed over old Wallachia's story a bit. Wallachia, though, was one of the few as hadn't got none of the fish blood, being of a royal line that intermarried with royal lines on other islands. Wallachia, he showed Obed a lot of rites and incantations as had to do with the sea things, and let him see some of the folks in the village as had changed a lot from human shape. Somehow or other, though, he never would let him see one of the regular things from right out of the water. In the end, he give him a funny kind of thingamajig made out a lid or something that he said would bring up the fish, things from any place in the water where they might be a nest of them. The idea was to drop it down with the right kind of prayers and setch. Well, I care loud as the things were scattered all over the world, so's anybody that looked about could find a nest and bring them up if they was wanted. Matt, he didn't like this business at all and wanted Obed Shud keep away from the island, but the captain was sharp for gain and found he could get them gold-like things so cheap it'd pay him to make a specialty of them. Things went on that way for years and Obed got enough of that gold-like stuff to make him start the refinery in Waite's old run-down fullin' mill. 
He didn't just sell the pieces like they was for folks to be all the time asking questions. All the same, his crews would get a piece and dispose of it now. And then, even though they were swore to keep quiet, and he let his women folks wear some of the pieces as was more human-like than most. Well, come about thirty-eight, when I was seven-year-old, Obed, he found the island people all wiped out between VHs. Seems the other islanders had got wind of what was going on and had took matters into their own hands. Suppose they must add after all, them old magic signs, as the sea things says was the only things they was afeard of. No telling what any of them, Kanakis, will chance to get a hold of when the sea bottom throws up some island with ruins older than the deluge. Pious cusses these was. They didn't leave nothing standing on either the main island or the little volcanic islet, except what parts of the ruins was too big to knock down. In some places there was little stones strewed about, like charms, with something on them like what you call a swastika nowadays. Probably them was the old ones' signs. Folks all wiped out, no trace of no gold-like things, and none of the nearby Kanakis had breathe a word about the matter. Wouldn't even admit they'd ever been any people on that island. That naturally hit Obed pretty hard, seeing as his normal trade was doing very poor. It hit the whole of Innsmouth too, because in seafaring days, what profited the master of a ship gently profited the crew proportionate. Most of the folks around the town took the hard times kind of sheep-like and resigned. But they was in bad shape because the fishing was petering out and the mills weren't doing none too well. Then's the time Obed, he begun a cursing at the folks for being dull sheep and praying to a Christian heaven as didn't help them none. He told them he'd know the folks as prayed to gods that give something you really need. And says if a good bunch of men had stand by him, he could maybe get a hold of Sartan powers as a bring plenty of fish and quite a bit of gold. Of course them as sarved on the Sumatry Queen and seed the island knowed what he meant. And want none too anxious to get closs to sea things like they'd hear tell on, but them as didn't know what was all abba out got kind of swayed by what Obed had to say, and begun to ask him what he could do to set him on the way to the faith as would bring him results. Here the old man faltered, mumbled, and lapsed into a moody and apprehensive silence glancing nervously over his shoulder and then turning back to stare fascinatedly at the distant black reef. When I spoke to him, he didn't answer, so I knew I would have to let him finish the bottle. The insane yarn I was hearing interested me profoundly, for I fancied there was contained within it a sort of crude allegory based upon the strangenesses of Innsmouth and elaborated by an imagination at once creative and full of scraps of exotic legend. Not for a moment did I believe that the tale had any really substantial foundation, but nonetheless the account held a hint of genuine terror. If only because it brought in references to strange jewels clearly akin to the malign tiara I had seen at Newburyport. Perhaps the ornaments had, after all, come from some strange island. And possibly the wild stories were lies of the bygone Obed himself, rather than of this antique toper. I handed Zadok the bottle, and he drained it to the last drop. It was curious how he could stand so much whiskey, for not even a trace of thickness had come into his high, wheezy voice. He licked the nose of the bottle and slipped it into his pocket, then beginning to nod and whisper softly to himself. I bent close to catch any articulate words he might utter and thought I saw a sardonic smile behind the stained, bushy whiskers. Yes, 
He was really forming words, and I could grasp a fair proportion of them. Poor Matt. Matt, he Alice was again it, tried to line up the folks on his side and had long talks with the preachers. No use. They run the congregational parson out of town and the Methodist fella quit. Never did see resolved Babcock, the Baptist parson. Again, wrath of Jehovah, I was a mighty little critter. But I heard what I heard and seen what I seen. Dagon and Ashtoreth, Belial and Beelzebub, Golden Calf and the idols of Canaan and the Philistines, Babylonish abominations, Mene, Mene, Tekel, Upasin. 